and uh, thank you to uh, Ben, Matt, and Susie for uh, putting the session together. Um, so uh, my talk, which I apologize will be, be mostly read, uh, is really about my research, which focuses on what I would say is the intersection between indigenous ecologies uh, and archaeology, which uh, is sort of one subset uh, of, of environmental uh, humanities. In the Andes, the most visually striking archaeological markers of the relationship between humans and mountains are undoubtedly agricultural, agricultural terraces. The great South American empires such as the Inca, the Wari, and the Tiwanaku are justifiably famous for their impressive landscape modification projects, which entailed the terracing of enormous swathes of the Andean countryside, and in the process consumed vast quantities of labor and material resources. The basic question I want to address in this talk, then, is why were these terraces actually built? At first blush, this may seem like a question to which we already have the answer. As uh, an agricultural technology, terracing is not unique to the Andes, and its advantages are not generally seen as particularly mysterious. Hill slopes are, of course, subject to significant levels of erosion, and the retaining properties of terrace walls therefore help to promote soil conservation. A second advantage is the creation of microclimates more suitable for particular crop species. This is primarily due to the increased levels of moisture within the deeper soils of terrace hillsides, which in turn lead to greater capacity for heat storage. In one study by Jean-Pierre Protzen, for example, it was noted that the extensive terracing around the Inca royal estate of Ollantaytambo had the effect of raising the ambient temperature of the site by up to 3 degrees C. Thus, a major staple like maize can, through terracing projects, be grown at elevations up to 500 metres higher than would normally be possible. Or lowland crops, such as coca and chilli peppers, can be cultivated in highland valleys that would otherwise be too cold for them. A third off-sided benefit of terraces is that they facilitate associated irrigation systems. Indeed, many, perhaps even most Inca terraces, also include parallel water channels, something of a particular importance in climatic regimes with a pronounced dry season. Many of the most elaborate Inca terracing projects, and certainly the most photogenic, were specifically associated with royal estates, Machu Picchu being the most famous example. Traditionally, these sites have been regarded as essentially a form of pre-colonial plantation. That is, entities not, at all diff not all that different from the latifundia of the senatorial and equestrian classes in the Roman Empire, or from the plantations established by Europeans in the colonial Americas. Within the conceptual language of modern social science, they are usually presented as privately owned tracts of agricultural land and associated infrastructure held by an aristocratic class and worked by groups of retainers or indentured servants. Indeed, the logic of the Inca's estate system is commonly related in almost capitalistic terms. That is, they were manifestations of an elite desire to acquire greater amounts of productive land, maximize its exploitation so as to produce higher crop yields, and so increase their personal wealth. The tr traditional kind is therefore highly rationalistic in its assumptions and sees the estate system as primarily driven by familiar, which is to say modern, economic goals. And terracing, as a form of technology, fits in perfectly with this account of rational self-interest, a <coughs> form of wealth accumulation that is achieved through the maximisation of agricultural productivity, promoting soil conservation, engineering microclimates tailored to the most valuable cultigen species, and irrigating to extend the growing season all work to further such productivity. Or so the story goes. But when you actually start to scrutinize the pre-colonial terracing projects of the ancient Andes, many of these assumptions start to fall apart. To start with, let's return to the royal estate at Ollantaytambo. Here we find the very large and sweeping terraces of the kind we've already seen. But elsewhere at the site, we find terracing projects that seem to make much less sense. Consider these tiny examples set into a rocky cliff face. Small as they are, they've been carefully built up to the construction of masonry retaining walls. But the area of some of these terrace fields is actually smaller than the areas of the vertical surfaces holding them up. The calories that would have been extracted from these fields, only a few square meters in extent at most, would never have compensated for the energy that was invested in their construction in the first place. The question then is, why bother? Were they simply symbolic adjuncts to the larger, real terraces found elsewhere in the estate? Perhaps an aesthetic finishing touch added for the sake of completion to ensure that no piece of cultivable ground was left unimproved. Turning to another example, the royal estate at Amaybamba includes a series of nicely constructed Inca terraces in the classic 
imperial style. And as you can see from the surrounding vegetation, this estate is at a much lower elevation, around 1,700 metres, which is low in the Andes, uh, than Ollantaytambo, the previous case. In fact, as this graphic illustrates, the Amaybamba estate is the lowest royal estate known to exist in the entire Inca Empire. So in this particular case, it's difficult to explain the terracing in terms of creating warmer microclimates, since at this altitude, temperatures are already optimal for growing coca, growing co crops such as maize and coca. And further increases in the ambient temperature would have had little practical effect. Moreover, the scale of the terracing in the Amaybamba is actually rather limited in extent. From the archaeological survey of the valley, there were two major terracing sectors noted, lying on opposite sides of the Rio Locomayo and in close proximity to the palatial compound at Waman Marca, shown here in the map. In total, 9.5 hectares of land was terraced in the Amaybamba drainage, which is not really a lot of land, especially for an estate belonging to an imperial ruler. However, we are very fortunate in the case of the Amaybamba because there is surviving written documentation from the colonial era which describes the precise size of the royal estate in association with the Waman Market Palace. In a legal dispute between Juan Jerónimo de Henares and a Diego López de Álvarez, put before the Royal, the royal Audiencia in Lima in 1579, i.e. 46 years after the fall of the Inca Empire to the Spanish, the size of the Waman Market estate was given as 300 anagadas. Anagata is an archaic unit of land once used throughout the Spanish Empire, but 300 anagatas is roughly equivalent to 78 hectares. Not only is that a more respectable land holding for an, empire, for an emperor, but comparing the archaeological evidence with the documentary evidence therefore tells us that only 1 20th of the estate at Waman Marque was terraced. So what was the purpose of such limited terracing? It had virtually no impact on productivity, either in terms of combating erosion or the manipulation of microclimates. And even if it did, the area involved was so small, it would hardly have affected the overall output of the Waman Market estate. In other words, it all looks very tokenistic, as if it were driven by some other logic than one that would accord with our understanding of rationalistic economic exploitation of the land. So in the first case of Oyente Tambo, it was difficult to explain all of the terracing with respect to the rational maximization of production. In Amaybamba, it's difficult to explain any of it in such terms. As a final example, uh, I want to turn to the most famous state of all again, Machu Picchu, and consider the third rationale traditionally offered for terraces, namely their association with irrigation. As I've said, Inca terraces at royal estates are virtually always associated with complex water management systems of canals and fountains. And these have also been traditionally interpreted as filling the function of crop irrigation. Yet paleoclimatological studies have cast considerable doubt on this in recent decades. Data obtained from the coring of the Kalkaya Glacier actually shows that the heyday of the Inca Empire, and thus Machu Picchu, was a period of relatively extensive rainfall in the central Andes. And as Kenneth Wright and Valencia Zagara's calculations uh, of the hydrology of Machu Picchu have indicated, there would have been sufficient rainfall moisture to render irrigation of its terraces unnecessary, at least for the purposes of growing crops. So despite the great labor investment and engineering skill that went into them, the extensive water management projects in Machu Picchu were, in productive terms, superfluous. Why then devote so much effort to irrigating fields that didn't need it? To answer this question and so understand what we are seeing in the archaeological record, I think we need to set aside how we think of mountains and ask what they were for ancient Andean peoples. In indigenous <coughs> Andean languages such as Aymara and Quechua, the words used to describe mountains all mean something like lord. In Quechua, the most common term for an important mountain peak is apu, a word which the lexicographer Gonzalo Solguin translates in his 1608 Quechua Spanish dictionary as Señor Grande or Juez Superior, Rey a great lord or high judge, a king. The equivalent term in Aymara is Malku, which means much the same thing. And interestingly, even where indigenous Andeans have adopted Spanish words to describe mountains in more recent times, they often don't use the term montaña. For example, in Paul Gellis' ethnography of Quechua speakers from the Colca Valley, he points out that there, there they call mountains cabildos, a <coughs> word that refers to a kind of municipal government or town council. In other words, irrespective of the language, Andean names for mountains always imply an entity that is a political authority or something possessed of high status. 
Incidentally, the very same word, Apu, was frequently applied to human lords by the Incas as well. The point being that the word itself is neutral with respect to whether it refers to a human or a mountain, and that would always require further qualification in context. Several Spanish texts recount a particularly interesting <coughs> episode which took place during the well-known dynastic war between the imperial half-brothers Atahualpa and Huascar, the same one that had just been concluded in Atahualpa's favour on the eve of the Spanish conquest. During the war, a particular mountain called Catequil in the province of Huamachuco predicted that Atahualpa would be defeated in an upcoming battle, an oracular pronouncement that unsurprisingly did not go down too well with Atahualpa himself. And as it turns out, Atahualpa was victorious in this conflict and naturally turned his attention to the, offend the offending mountain. The mountain's sentence for its offence was execution, which involved a significant detachment of Atahualpa's army being dispatched to the mountaintop, where they first immolated it and then spent a period of three months grinding down the summit. Seemingly, this was the mountainous equivalent of being hung, drawn and quartered in the prehistoric Andes. The 16th century chronicler Juan Diez de Betanzos uh, recorded Atahualpa's reaction as follows. When Atahualpa heard it, the prediction, <coughs> he was very angry at these words and said this Guaca, this mountain, is also as much an enemy Alca as Huascar, his half-brother whom he was fighting. The word Alca means something like traitor here in this, in this particular context. The key point is that mountains were not just persons in the ancient Andes, but political subjects as well and thus were accountable members of the body politic to precisely the same degree as everyone else. By definition, only a political subject can commit treason against a sovereign. The political lives of Andean mountains were rich and varied. In addition to being potential traitors, the Incas often gave them rich gifts and servants, which seems to have been particularly common for the mountains far to the south in modern-day Chile and Argentina, perhaps equivalent to placating foreign dignities and potentates with presents. Among themselves, mountains had both gender and kinship relations, and some were recognised as married couples who ar whose arguments took the form of thunderstorms. They could own property too, and in several accounts they were even required to pay tribute to the state. In the Andes, even if you were a mountain, the two great inevitabilities were still death and taxes. So if the Incas' physical interactions with mountains cannot be accommodated to our rationale of resource extraction and productivity, then why did they go to all this effort? The key to answering this question is the fact that if mountains were, in the social sense, elite persons, <coughs> mountain sides were, in physical terms, bodies. When we consider where the royal estates and their terraces are located, not only are they on mountain sides, they are also constructed on the slopes of major mountains that were known as particularly important apu, or lords. And it seems it was the tallest mountains, and especially glaciated peaks, that were the most revered as elite persons. Machu Picchu, for example, is part of the Salkantay range, and today at least Salkantay is considered, along with Ausangate, one of the two most powerful mountains in the Andes by Quechua-speaking communities. The royal estate at Amaybamba, shown here, was set into two mountain sides on opposite banks of the Rio Lucumayo. The southern set of terraces lies on the lower slopes of the mountain range capped by the Veronica Glacier. Veronica is its Spanish name, but early colonial documents indicate it was referred to as Vacaivoca in the Inca period, a term which means something like the sacred being that weeps. Interestingly, water runoff is widely conceptualized as the body fluids of mountains throughout the Andes. Just as the soil is the flesh and bone of the mountain, its hydraulic component is understood in varying contexts as its tears, breast milk, blood, urine, semen, or sweat. In the logic of the indigenous Andes, then, terraces are modifications of the mountain's body in effort to bring its physical form into a regulated state of order. In that sense, it's perhaps better thought of as a kind of bodily discipline in the classic social scientific sense derived from Foucault, like a soldier who marches in a line, manipulating their weapon with a proficient virtuosity, and who salutes the authorities as required, terracing disciplined the bodies of the mountains and made their everyday movements, in terms of their flowing waters and their soils, run in accordance with the desires of the Incas. This gets to the heart of the revisionist translation I'm proposing here in terms of what an Inca terrace was in the eyes of those who constructed them. They were a physical apparatus intended to control and manipulate the bodies of the sentient mountains, or what the Peruvian ethnographer Marisol de la Cadena has aptly called the earth fiends. It was not important that the terraces be irrigated to provide water for crops, or that soil be retained to construct microclimates. Rather, the goal was to bring the mountains' bodies into a well-regulated and productive order and the crops would therefore follow if the mountain was obedient. 
as well as to signal their obedience to Inca authority. The correctly flowing waters were like a gesture or salute, acknowledging who was ultimately in charge. We look at them as fields that just happen to be on mountain sides, but from the Inca's perspective, mountains were elite actors, a parallel society of non-human aristocrats who were deeply bound up with everyday human affairs. This is still true in the Andes today, where the activities of international mining corporations have involved cutting huge scars into mountainsides in search of mineral wealth. One of the consequences of this form of violent extraction has been protests from present-day indigenous communities who perceive such treatment of the mountain lords as physical assaults on their bodies, maiming and even crippling them, which obviously has knock-on effects for the humans who live in proximity to them. So thinking of terraces as fields is not a particularly appropriate translation of the Inca viewpoint. Instead, for them, terracing is a form of bodily intervention, a very deliberate and organized corporal manipulation of the mountains. It is important to emphasize here that none of what I've been talking about is mere symbolic manipulation. It's all very much concrete and physical. Royal estates were intended to make mountains more productive, but not according to our criteria. Instead, they recreated them as laborers who had more regulated and obedient bodies, just as the productivity of a factory relies on its human workers' bodies being made into compliant and well-trained cogs in the overall machine. Terraces do indeed promote soil retention, but the outcome of this for the Incas was not a more stable, exploitable landscape from which they could extract greater quantities of inanimate resources. Instead, it was the ensuring of the mountain's bodily integrity. In other words, an investment in the health of their non-human workers. The Inca logic I'm describing here was not irrational, it simply partook of a different rationality. And to sum up, this is the key point, and it's important to be clear here uh, as, uh, as possible. The Inca's view of mountain was not a misapprehension, nor some veneer of religious cosmology draped over the concrete economic reality of rational production. The Inca's view of mountains as productive and disciplined non-human laborers was just as effective uh, an understanding of them as inanimate repos repositories of natural resources of winning commodification, i.e. our view. We can continue to translate Inca terracing projects in our familiar economic terms, ignoring the quite different ways in which Andean societies relate to mountains, and our archaeological interpretations will probably get by all right. But as a consequence, the empirical record will continue to throw up anomalies and logical gaps. We'll get the irrigation canals in Machu Picchu that fed fields in no need of irrigation. We'll get the mini terraces around Taitambo that required more energy to build than they ever produced. And we'll have the terraces in the Amaybamba working to improve an already optimal climate. There are many reasons to pay attention to indigenous understandings of the world, but perhaps one of the most pragmatic is that it will simply make us better interpreters of the archaeological record. Thank you.